Hi. Welcome back to Existential Psychology here at the University of West Georgia. Uh, this video will be the second video where we're going to be exploring the philosophy of Martin Heidegger and more specifically the philosophy that derives from his most famous work, Being in Time, published in 1927. Okay, so in the last video, what did we do? Well, the first video in this series was dedicated mostly to setting up Heidegger's project so that you understand the hermeneutic structure of phenomenology the way Heidegger thinks of it. The second thing we did was we introduced a couple of fairly nuclear uh, insights that derive from that project, the first of which has to do with the nature of Dasein, or being in the world. So he's going to be characterizing being in terms of Dasein, and by the way, uh, the German is often retained uh, in a lot of these coinages, and the second of which has to do with aletheia, which is not a German word, but a Greek word that Heidegger appropriates to characterize the nature of the truth of being as a kind of uncovering. And as we saw in the last video, one of the surprising sides to uh, uncovering is that it also covers. Every truth is also a kind of concealing. That revealing and concealing as the fundamental dynamisms that run throughout truth at the most fundamental level are reciprocal. So every truth uh, also conceals something. We don't have the, uh, the perspective of God, which would be, I guess, in theory, to be able to see things without anything being concealed. Our human way of perceiving the world is in terms of uh, a, a reciprocal dynamic of revealing and concealing. Okay, so that's all stuff from last time. So uh, what I wanted to do in the first video was just do that. Set up the project, introduce some basic vocabulary, and in this video I really want to start digging into some of the more specific phenomenological insights that Heidegger derives from his hermeneutically structured idea of the movement of phenomenology. Okay, so uh, the first one is uh, going to have to do with care. So the question is, how is Dasein in the world? And one of the first ways he has of answering uh, that question is that we're not in the world as a matter of indifference. We're in the world as a matter of concern. Our being in the world is of concern to us. And he uses the German word Sorge, or care in English, to describe that. So uh, we are in the world in terms of care. Now, here's the trick about that. Um, often when he, people hear or people peer, people hear about Sorga and this care structure and care business, they think, oh, Heidegger, Martin Heidegger, he's such a nice, warm, fuzzy philosopher because he conceives of the fundamental nature of being in terms of care. Well, actually, care is a much broader category than maybe you think at first, because at first you think of care, you might think of, what would you think of? Like the care bears or something like that, warm and fuzzy and friendly. Well, the thing is that negative experiences are all also modes of care when you think about it. And I gave you the example in your notes of hatred, which is probably one of the more negative experiences you can uh, imagine, I'm guessing. Well, it turns out that hatred is a mode of care. Well, how so? Because uh, when you hate someone or something, let's say someone, um, the last thing you are is indifferent toward that person. Okay, When you hate someone, you care, in a sense, very much what happens to that person. You care so much that you hope that negative things happen to that person. But the point is that you still care when you hate, All right, when you despise someone or loathe someone or uh, something like that. So it's care, the way you have to think about it when you first hear of Sorge in German, right? the German word Sorge, is in terms of a much broader idea of what it is to care than maybe you think at first. So it's not going to be care bearers type of care. It's going to be a much broader sense. Now, the next thing Heidegger does is he further articulates uh, the meaning of care in terms of what he calls the care structure. Now, um, there are going to be three 
main components to the care structure and Heidegger sort of loves <laughs> three-part structures although later in his writings he talks about the fourfold as one way of characterizing Daseins being in the world but uh, in being in time they're definitely a preference for threefold structures so uh, let's outline the uh, threefold structure first and then go into detail about what each one of those components is so it's going to um, consist of facticity fallenness and existentiality so once again little repetition to help you learn facticity fallenness and existentiality. So let's look at them one by one. Okay, so the first one, facticity. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Where have I heard that term before? Oh, it was in those videos about Jean-Paul Sartre when we were talking about the nature of factical freedom and I said kind of quickly, like there's a kind of reciprocity between the choices we make and the dimensions of limitation that are inevitably part of life. So we choose with respect to these dimensions of limitation. And I said kind of quickly, uh, what this means is that our freedom is factical. And here's where Sartre takes an idea from Martin Heidegger. So now, a couple videos later, we've happened upon this idea as part of the care structure from being in time. All right, so facticity. So let's remind ourselves of what we said about facticity a couple videos ago. So facticity has to do with all of the limits of life, all of the givens that are not merely a product of our choice. And uh, some examples, once again, we mentioned these in the previous video, like probably the most obvious example is that you're in a particular body and not the one that maybe you would choose if you were an infinitely uh, free being that could choose anything in the world. Like, well, you know, probably, uh, unless you're very lucky, your body has certain strengths and certain weakness, certain positive qualities, certain negative qualities. And, and so uh, probably at some level you wouldn't mind being in a body that retained those strengths and yet dispensed with the weaknesses. Well, you know, you can't just sort of uh, wish real hard and being uh, and be in a, uh, in my case, maybe a younger body, you know, because I'm about to turn 60 years old. So maybe uh, a younger body, like a 25-year-old, or maybe, uh, you know, most of my students are probably like 20, 21, something like that. A 21-year-old body uh, would be nice, especially when you, uh, you encounter some of the physical el uh, dimensions of facticity associated with getting older. Like, your facticity, in a bodily way, announces itself uh, much more uh, saliently in old a older age than it does when you're young. It's easy to not even notice it. Okay, they were born in a certain point in time and not another one and maybe you have a fantasy about like hanging out with the Medici's in Renaissance Florence or something like that. Wouldn't that be cool? That would be like hella dope. That would be so cool to be able to do that. Well, the thing is part of your facticity is that you're born when you're born and consequently you live a life when you live a life. In this case, the early 21st century and not the 15th century, hanging out and chilling with the Medicis in the crib in Florence. All right, so uh, born into a certain culture and not another one. And yeah, you can change your culture to an extent. You can change your body too. You know, you can lose weight or uh, lift weights or whatever. You know, probably a bunch of you are doing this. You know, maybe dieting down possibly or maybe getting fatter during the corona apocalypse. You know, okay. So uh, anyhow, there are all these dimensions of facticity that are part and parcel of your being in the world. Okay, so. Of all the dimensions of your facticity, there's one that Heidegger probably talks about the most, and it's in there in big uh, bold letters in your notes, and it's this idea of thrownness, thrownness, that we are thrown into this world seemingly without any prior choice. And from the point of view of phenomenology, it's not as though if you're doing phenomenology, you can easily defer to some kind of karmic structure whereby you're in this particular incarnation as a result of karma accumulated across many lifetimes. Like, who knows if that's really true or not from a phenomenological perspective, at least from a Western European <laughs> phenomenological perspective. It's not as though we have any privileged access to the truth of that. As far as we know, we're just sort of thrown into the world and uh, we have to live a life. So into this house we're born into this world we're thrown like a dog without a bone an actor out alone riders on the storm yes so jim morrison dude having 
a kind of Heideggerian moment in his song, Riders on the Storm. So into this house we're born, into this world we're thrown. Man, it's like, it's almost like a line out of being in time, you know, into this world we're thrown. Very Heideggerian way of saying it. Okay, so uh, first dimension of the care structure, facticity, all of the givens that you do not simply choose and are, the, are not simply the product of immediate alteration by way of your choices. Okay, so second element of facticity, so fallenness, fallenness. Wow, okay, wow, what a powerful sort of poetic uh, idea. So in some way, we're in the world in the mode of falling away. Well, how would that be? Well, what are we falling away from? Maybe that's a good first question. Well, what we're falling away from most of the time in our lives is our deeper possibilities. Okay, so the idea here is that each one of us has something like uh, our own most potentiality for being. And wow, you may think, what a bizarre contrived phrase. That's actually the phrase that appears in Being in Time. So our own most potentiality for being, so own most, that's kind of a rare word in English, but if you sort of break it apart and turn it backwards, it kind of tells you what it means. So a range of possibilities that is most your own, given that you are who you are in a particular uh, culture in a particular historical period, all those dimensions of facticity, there would be something like a potentiality for you to be that would be most your own. That's the thing we fall away from most of the time. He says it this way in translation, uh, approximately and for the most part, Dasein exists in the mode of fallenness. And once again, you're probably getting a sense as I'm starting to quote being in time more for how abstruse this language sounds and that's part of why I'm doing these lectures for you so that I can do a kind of translation process and you can take up these ideas in a much more immediate and accessible way. So uh, we fall away from our own most potentiality for being and we're going to say a lot more about that later in the video. Basically this is a way of talking about inauthenticity. Okay, so inauthenticity. Okay, so hopefully in your mind this is going to help you out on the test. You're connecting up thrownness with facticity, and now inauthenticity with fallenness, a falling away from our deeper possibilities and potentials and destiny in life. And from Heidegger's point of view, that's what we do most of the time. And then the third, more on that later though, um, the third element of the care structure has to do with what he calls existentiality. Now, Here's an unfortunate uh, turn of linguistic events that happens in being in time. He uses uh, the word existential and existentiality and the other cognates of the word existence in different ways at different point in time. Um, and it makes for some level of confusion. But here, when we're talking about existentiality as part of the care structure, it's referring to something very different. And in a way, the way you should easily think about it is it's the opposite of fallenness. So existentiality is going to be about authenticity, not inauthenticity. Okay, so what is authenticity about? Well, if you just invert the description I just gave you, you'll probably have an idea. So if, for the most part, Dasein falls away from its own most potentiality for being, its deeper possibilities, its deeper destiny, then what do we do maybe every now and then? If you're lucky, it's possible to live your whole life in a mode of inauthenticity. But if you're lucky and you choose yourself in some sense, uh, you could start to exist authentically in other words, in the mode of real existentiality, and that's about living toward your own most potentiality for being. So it's about realizing that and actualizing that, which is to say, to live toward your deepest possibilities, given that you are who you are and all the elements of facticity that define in a rough and approximate way your being. Okay, so once again, let's take a second to summarize. So. Care structure, Dasein is in the world concernfully, not as a matter of um, pure apathy or indifference or something like that. Three basic elements to that, the element of facticity, that's the givenness of things, the element of fallenness, that's the element of inauthenticity, and then the element of existentiality, that's the element of authenticity. So what we need to do now is talk in more detail about inauthenticity and then authenticity. All right, so to run in parallel with your notes, let's describe fallenness or inauthenticity in more detail. So how do we fall away from our deeper possibilities in life? Okay, so here's the Heideggerian answer. Uh, the main way that that happens is through the dynamics of conformity and obedience 
with respect to what he calls in German Das Mann. Okay, so Das Mann, sort of like, it sounds a little bit like the man, all right, but usually it's translated as the they in English. So we do what they say, okay, and in English we have a similar convention, all right, so we say, they say you should lose weight, they say you should stay home for the coronavirus. They say that if you go out in public, you should wear a mask. They say you should quit smoking. Uh, they say you should go to college, let's say. Um, they say you should do well on your tests. Now, in English, although every now and then you can pin a name and a face to who the they actually are, most of the time you cannot, okay? It's hard to say who they are that tell you you should quit smoking, you should lose weight, you should get your cholesterol checked, and so on. Who are this they? Well, Heidegger's treatment of it, which I think is actually not a bad insight into who, this, who the they really are, is that it's no one in particular. It's the way meaning, something like meaning and significance gets propagated anonymously across the social terrain. Okay, so the reason why it's so damn hard to find a name and a face to pin onto who they are that tell you so damn many things in your life is there for the most part there is no name in the face it's anonymous anonymous social dynamics and for the most part they have to do with conformity so a big part of what we do in, with our lives is we look around we, and we see what other people are doing and we do variations on the same thing okay so this is a large fraction of life that you know you see your uh, other people wearing a certain kind of clothes and you end up wearing a certain kind of clothes, the same kind of clothes and so on. Like, uh, and the other dynamic is that of obedience. So, uh, you know, if you look around and you uh, uh, notice that other people are doing something and for whatever reason you don't conform, uh, usually there's someone around to try to get you to conform by issuing you orders. And his insight into inauthenticity is that for the most part, that's how we are in the world. Most of the time, we're sort of on autopilot, just sort of conforming. And when it comes down to it, if someone issues an order, for the most part, we obey and do what we're told. But what we're not doing in all of that is living toward our own most, slowing down so you can hear it, our own most potentiality, our own most power for existence. That's not what we're doing most of the time. Most of the time, we're just going through the damn motions in, in kind of a mechanical way and that's inauthenticity so i gave you some examples like you know you'll, you'll you turn on tv or the internet and you just do what other people are doing like you you get whatever an instagram account why do you get an instagram account because everyone else is and okay you, you get the idea now uh, authenticity let's take a few seconds to come to characterize authenticity so that would be dasein's choosing its own most potentiality for being, and Heidegger describes it in terms of a kind of choice. So inauthenticity is sort of the default. Unless you choose your life, unless you choose your being, your default is going to be just to sort of move mechanically by way of conformity and obedience through your existence until eventually you die. So for the most part, we're lost. We're fallen. <laughs> Our souls are lost and fallen, and they're lost and fallen into this ocean of conformity and obedience. We do what they say. We do what they do. They do it. So we do it. Okay? So to have a moment of existing authentically is an anomalous moment. And in order to experience such a moment, in some way you have to choose yourself. You have to choose your life. You have to take hold of the reins of your existence, your unique, unduplicatable, and all too fleeting existence on planet Earth in order to begin to exist authentically. Because the default, unless you choose yourself, the default is going to be you're just going to follow the herd. You're just going to follow the they. Das Mann in German. Okay, so, uh, okay, so that's what authenticity is about is perceiving and then living toward your deepest possibilities in this life. So let's say that again because, man, we're running against the grain of prevailing social custom for sure. To perceive who and what you are in your depths, 
the deepest, most powerful, most luminous, most, most uh, musical possibilities that reside through all of the possibilities that you could live out. There's some subset of that, which would be the deepest, most powerful, most interesting, most brilliant thing you could possibly live out, given that you are who you are. Your own most potentiality for life, for existence, for being. Okay, this is what it is to authenticate to exist authentically, to perceive that and not just perceive it, but then to actualize it, to make it real in the concrete moments of your life, to start to live toward what you can be in this world and not just default to whatever the hell everyone else is doing. Okay, so <laughs> I felt like, you, you know, you gotta say these things in a powerful way or people are just gonna, it's gonna be just another thing that you're obeying me, you're conforming to me. And if you're obeying me when I'm telling you about what authentic existence is about, or you're just trying to conform to what I'm saying, you're already lost. The fix is already in. You getting it? It's not about you're obeying your professors or your teachers or your elders or your parents or anyone else. Not even Oprah. Oh my God. Not even obeying Oprah is blasphemy. <laughs> All right. But, um,. Yeah, you have to choose your life at some point. At some point, it may be important for you to start to think for yourself and grab hold of the reins of your life and ride that wild, charging, powerful stallion as though it were worth your time. Okay, so uh, just a thought, just a weird thought. I know you're young and all that. Here's just a weird thought for you. Okay, it might be important to start to live your life at some point. Right? <laughs> Weird thought. Okay, so a couple, let's get past a couple uh, misconceptions about the nature of authenticity. Here's what you have to get past, and hopefully maybe you've already sort of perceived this a little bit. That in normal English, when we talk about authenticity, a lot of what we mean most of the time is like when we say someone's being authentic, a lot of the time what we mean is they're being something like sincere or honest or what they say is really what they think or something like that. So let's use the word sincerity as a marker of that. Heideggerian authenticity is not about that. Okay? <laughs> How you getting it? It's about a particular relation to your potential, to your possible power that's running through your existence, that if you were to live toward it, you might make it real. So it's not about sort of honesty or sincerity or any, any of the common sort of usages of authenticity. It's about a particular relation to your possibility. Okay, so that's the first misconception. Now, the second misconception, I think, uh, in of Heidegger's idea of authenticity is that sometimes, and I've heard big name people doing this, and I, I can't understand really why they do it, but they'll, they'll conflate the activity of doing uh, phenomenological ontology with authenticity, such that the more able you are to have phenomenological ontological insights into life, the more authentic you are. And I think that's a grave misreading of what Heidegger means by that. Authenticity is not about how sort of intellectually agile you are so that you can have these incredible intellectualized insights into the structure of being. It's not about that at all. It's about a particular relation to your unique possibility. So the question is, uh, can you be, let's say, intellectually disadvantaged. I'll try to be polite because it's the 21st century and politically correct. Can you be intellectually disadvantaged or challenged or something like that and still live an authentic life? And I think the Heideggerian answer is obviously, well, yeah, as long as you're living toward your deepest potentiality, your own most potentiality, that's what defines authenticity, not how intellectually agile you are or how high your damn IQ is or anything like that. So, um, uh, to me, uh, this is a misunderstanding. Similarly, uh, is it possible for you to be very intellectually agile and philosophically astute and yet be the most inauthentic being on the planet? And I think the answer to that is also, yeah, of course that's possible. You know, so yes, you can be uh, in much the same way that, you know, you can be uh, intellectually very astute and be morally completely corrupt in much the same way that you can be that. You can also be intellectually very astute and agile and quick and clever and all that kind of stuff and be living the most inauthentic existence imaginable, just conforming and obeying and using your your well-developed and refined intellectual capacity to further the project of being as inauthentic as possible, to follow the they in an intellectualized, 
clever way. Not that that would ever happen on college campuses, and incidentally, that is sarcasm. Okay, so um, authenticity and inauthenticity. All right, so big idea from Martin Heidegger, which by the way, um, you know, if you're in the humanistic psych class, this is probably starting to sound like uh, the way Maslow thinks about self-actualization. Well, here's the thing about that, is that Maslow was very well versed in these kinds of thinking, especially existential phenomenological type thinking, like that of Martin Heidegger. Okay, so let's uh, reconnoiter, as it were. Uh, see how long this video is getting. Okay, so maybe that's enough for this video. I don't like to make them too long because I want to keep them in more or less bite-sized digestible pieces for you and not drag you to death. Okay, so uh, let's, uh, that's a wrap, people. So let's um, put an end to this video. I hope you're having a great day, wonderful, warm. I'm looking out the window. Uh, sunny day here in Georgia. And uh, I hope you're enjoying your corona apocalypse as much as possible. You know, there's a lot of herd mentality in the corona apocalypse. A lot of the they in authenticity, conformity, and obedience that goes along with the corona apocalypse. So maybe you can use the fact that you're living through this particular historical episode as a way of providing a kind of confirmation of some of these Heideggerian insights. Like, notice where they tell you to do something, or they tell you to do this, that, or they tell you not to do something. And uh, in the midst of that, who knows, perhaps see if you can have a moment of glimpsing and then realizing, even in the overwhelming facticity of the coronavirus and all of that kind of stuff, even in the midst of all of that stuff, see if you can start to live your life, okay? It doesn't matter whether you're in your house or you're in somewhere else. It requires no special occasion. See if you can really start to think for yourself and start to live your life, at least for a moment or two, against all odds, in this time and in this place. Have a great, authentic day.